Hills Art School and the Center for Civic Education. Welcome everyone to tonight's Hofstra Votes program. And what a terrific program we have. Now the results of this evening's program will be even more terrific if everyone in this audience eligible to do so makes a commitment to vote in the upcoming election and every election that follows. Thank you. Now I understand that apathy sometimes stands in the way of voting, just the sense that it doesn't make a difference. My wife helped encourage our older daughter, who has these feelings, to vote in a very subtle way. She sent her a text message that stated, since you value your allowance, please register and vote. <laughs> Economics clearly has a role to encourage voting. Now a, a few words about our distinguished speaker. Paul Krugman is a CUNY Graduate Center distinguished professor. He's a New York Times columnist. He's also a Nobel Prize winning economist, and he is extraordinarily prolific. And his roots are Long Island, very close to Hofstra University. He grew up in Merrick and graduated from John F. Kennedy High School in Belmore after which he attended Yale for his bachelor's degree and MIT for his doctorate. Now, I hear from the audience, did someone graduate uh, John Kennedy in the audience? Yes, okay. All right, good. Dr. Krugman's positions are very clear, and his reasoning in economics and politics is compelling and often provocative. As an example, please look at his recent column in the New York Times on the paranoid style of GOP politics. It's an honor for me to present Paul Krugman. Thank, thank you. Uh, it's great to uh, great to to be here, um, and uh, the uh, um, a few memories. You know, this is this is my my homeland. Uh, and as I, I can report that the Long Island Railroad has not improved. Um, okay, so somehow or other in putting this together, we neglected to settle on a uh, topic for the talk. And so they came up with, uh, uh, does it matter who wins the midterms? So the answer is no, lecture is finished. Um, okay, uh, no, but so I, I, I thought I would, um, uh, enlarge that a bit to more, you know, what, what will be happening, because there, there are different uh, questions to be asked. And the, the simple question, you know, what, what, what's going to happen to the GDP growth rate in the, in the year following the midterm is, is not the right question to be asking. Um, and so I thought I'd start off by explaining where that no comes from, and then, um, and then talk about things that really are on the line, because uh, th this, is, this is obviously going to be I was going to say this is going to be the most crucial election, uh, but it seems to me like every uh, every election has been the most crucial election of our lifetimes. That the that it seems to be more and more at stake with each one. So so a, a huge n number of things, and and some of them have nothing to do with with economics, uh, but that's my other job. Um, it's the um, the but there are some things that certainly fall under the domain of economic policy that can be hugely important, and some of them may not hinge on the outcome. I'll explain about that in a minute. So um, I'm going to guess that the, that the clicker works. If not, I'll, I'll use the computer. Um, let me just talk first about what, what, what can we tell about what effect elections typically have on the economy. So um, this is total US employment, non-farm employment. And um, see the big breaks after the 2012 and 2016? Well, I don't either, right? Nothing. Uh, nothing visible happened to trends in U.S. employment with either of our uh, major presidential elections, or for that matter, there was there was obviously the the financial crisis and the Great Recession, um, and there was a turnaround, which I, I would think had something to do with uh, with um, White House policy. But after that, it's been actually almost bizarrely steady growth in employment since then. Um, there's always a temptation to say, well, the election must be crucial for the economy. And I have to admit that, much to my regret, in the, in the chaos of election night 2016, I gave in to that temptation and then retracted it three days later. Uh, you, you want to think that something that may have momentous consequences for our lives is going to have 
an impact on the GDP numbers right away, and it doesn't work that way nor normally. In normal times, um, uh, the impact of elections on the economy is very, very minimal. Um, the, um, another picture to give you a bit more of a, a picture. So we, we um, uh, everybody knows about GDP growth. Uh, that's actually, people who really study this stuff say, you gotta be a little careful because uh, GDP is a very noisy number. And we actually, there, is, there are two numbers that, there's, that measure how big is the economy. The other one is gross domestic income. Gross domestic product is a measure of how much is being produced. Gross domestic income is a measure of how much income is being received. Um, in principle, they're the same. In practice, because uh, there's, there's a lot more um, guesswork involved in national income uh, numbers than you might think. Uh, then they, uh, they, they often, you know, over the long run, they tell the, the same story, but in the short run, they can vary. So what people really do this stuff say is you should average the two to get a sense of where the economy is going. So this is the average of the growth rates of GDP and GDI. And um, first of all, stuff is noisy, uh, even there. And secondly, again, you know, no, nothing much, uh, nothing much happens. Um, the reason it doesn't matter, it's not as if you don't sometimes have pretty major policy changes, but those policy changes under normal conditions don't do very much to move the needle on the economy as a whole because they tend to be offset by other stuff. Um, in particular, if the, somebody comes in and for whatever reason cuts taxes or increases spending, um, under normal conditions that will um, lead the, to a rise in interest rates. The Federal Reserve will say, well, that might be inflationary. They'll, they'll hike rates a bit. Um, and uh, what is given in the form of increased spending or increased spending power is taken away in the form of reduced interest rates, uh, which, which puts some crimp on housing, which uh, caused the dollar to get stronger, so it hurts the trade balance. Um, and you can actually see that. Uh, here, so we got a, uh, a new administration which uh, made it clear it was going to push for uh, big tax cuts and then delivered big tax cuts late last year. And the um, Federal Reserve started tightening and investors assumed it would continue. And so, gosh, uh, long-term interest rates, which are what matter, they're, they're up quite a lot uh, over that period. And so that's going to, uh, the time, you know, the timing it won't match up perfectly, but basically, uh, the uh, the increased spending coming out of the tax cut is going to be offset by it's going to be cr lead to crowding out of private of other forms of spending, and and it's just uh, GDP isn't going to uh, vary very much. Now that's the normal condition. There are times when that's not true. In 2009, 2010, actually even into 2011, 2013, um, with the economy still bouncing along the bottom, unemployment very high, and interest rates, the interest rates that the Federal Reserve controls at zero, so it could do no more, then none of this applied. Then it was the case that spending more would just lead to more spending, would not lead to a rise in interest rates. Spending less would just lead to less spending. So austerity policies, follow, which were followed um, in much of Europe at, in the depths of the, of the depressed period, really did depress economies. Um, yeah, the U.S. could have used a bigger, st the stimulus program uh, under Obama, even though it, uh, it wasn't enough to produce a dramatic turnaround, almost certainly uh, led to a shallower slump. Uh, it didn't seem shallow, but it could have been much worse uh, than, than we would have otherwise had. So in times of crisis, action by the White House, action by, by Congress matter a lot. Um, but at least for now, we're not in crisis. We're back in, in nor, norm, we've returned to normalcy so that the, uh, it really doesn't matter very much. If, um, if Democrats take one, one or two houses of Congress, uh, that, there won't be another tax cut. If Republicans hold, uh, there will. Um, what that will do for short-term growth, really no difference. So, it's, uh, so anyway, so that, that's, that's the end of the talk that I was supposed to give. Um, um, actually, a, a word about longer-term growth. So that's you know the, what happens to the economy in the in the very short run. Uh, what about you know over ten years? Might the policies that one that that we will have if Democrats win big 
be lead to a big difference in where the economy is 10 years from now? And the answer is probably not, even there. Uh, because long-term growth rates are really, really hard to move. They're just not, uh, they're, they depend on things like uh, technological progress, which is definitely uh, influenced only in a very indirect, remote way by whatever Congress and the President do. Um, rates of growth of labor force, well, I guess immigration policies could make some difference there, but it's not a big deal. Uh, probably not a big deal. Um, the uh, uh, rates of capital formation are affected some, but less than you might think. The way I like to put this is, and we had what was called tax reform in 2017. It was actually Reform is not really the word, but it was a big tax cut, and it was a, it actually made the system uh, more complicated and more more ridden with loopholes than before. Uh, but anyway, but but, it, uh, but people who think that you know a good tax reform is what you really need, they they often talk about the the 1986 tax reform, which was there was a really quite remarkable, it's certainly inconceivable in today's political landscape. It was bipartisan effort. It was genuinely revenue neutral. That is, the, the, some tax rates were cut, but they did really close loopholes so that the whole thing was. And it, it generally clearly made the system more rational, more efficient than it had been, what moved everything in the right direction. And if you look at US economic performance, uh, you can't see a trace of that pre tax reform. There's no hint that it made any difference at all to US economic growth. So even that was the Camelot of tax reform, and it, it, it failed to deliver anything measurable. So nothing that's likely to be on the table now is going to really make a difference to, to economic growth. Um, however, um, the growth of GDP is not the only thing that matters. And so in a lot of ways, the midterms could make a big difference on other fronts. So um, the first thing to say is, well, um, you know, budgets, uh, we, we, um, we probably obsess way too much about budget deficits. Uh, certainly the, that whole, that period when people were talking as if U.S. budget deficits were the most important issue, uh, uh, actually some of the people who said their budget deficits were the most important issue when we faced fiscal doom then promptly turned around and voted for a $2 trillion tax cut as soon as they had the chance. So, but the, but th that's an exaggerated concern, but obviously you have to worry a little bit uh, in, the, in the long run, even, even the U.S. government has to pay its bills. Um, and tax policy is, is one of those areas in which there's a huge divide between the parties. Uh, President Obama really did uh, raise taxes on top income significantly. It's not, it, people actually, uh, it's surprising how little, I, some of my more left-leaning friends uh, are under the impression that, that Obama didn't do anything about, about top incomes. In fact, he brought top, the, the average federal tax rate on the top 1% back to what it had been before Ronald Reagan. We basically completely reversed the, the tax cuts that had taken in between through a combination of uh, uh, special taxes, the taxes that pay for Obamacare uh, were largely levied on the top end. So the, we actually did um, see significant tax increases. Um, and uh, by contrast, We've just had a tax cut, which is, among other things, is pretty big in terms of revenue. Uh, this is the ratio of uh, federal tax receipts to GDP. And uh, tax cut in, uh, at the end of 2017, and yeah, well, that's 1% uh, that's of GDP uh, of, of revenue decline. It's, it's entirely because of the tax cut. And that's a big number. That's, that's more. Uh, to take a not random example, that's more than the total cost of all of the subsidies that, that make the, the Affordable Care Act work. So we, we had a, a program that uh, probably uh, added about 20 million people get, getting health insurance. Um, it costs money, but the tax cut was bigger than that. Um, it's, uh, so that's a... Uh, uh, that's a big difference, and clearly it, the, the, the tax cut was, among other things, actually this is part of what happened with Obama. Um, the, the Bush tax cuts, uh, in order to sidestep some uh, issues of, 
of uh, Senate procedure and also to, a, to attempt to hide just how expensive they were going to be. A lot of the stuff was designed to expire um, it, originally by 2010 and was extended a bit. But, but it, in part, Obama was able to raise taxes simply by not, uh, by not um, extending the tax cuts, just letting them expire. Um, and this, the 2017 tax cut, um, the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, had a, uh, a lot of sunsets in it. A lot of things go away uh, after uh, 2025. Uh, if Republicans hold, they will try to put those things back in. Uh, if Democrats uh, are there, the, although a lot of those are popular individual tax cuts, they'll be able to probably to extract some partial reversal of the other stuff as, as the price of extending it. So, so the, the, the state of the U.S. budget is going to depend a lot on the election, which in turn may have some effects in constraining or not constraining future policies. So that's one thing. It's hard to get really excited about, but this was a, this was a pretty big tax cut. And uh, it, it's uh, um, actually, it's kind of remarkable. Uh, one of the things that, that many of us are marveling over is that to have given away that much money and not have an issue you can run on in the election is kind of impressive. But the, uh, it turns out that attempts to, the tax cut remains net negative in public approval and Republican congressional candidates have pretty much stopped mentioning it. That's, you know, to give away 1% of GDP and, and not be able to make, a, uh, make that a vote winner is actually, that takes some talent. So that was kind of impressive. Um, okay. Um, What's really going to matter, this, this all affects the deficit, but the deficit doesn't, uh, it, you don't want to get into a position of thinking that deficits don't matter ever. That I, I have some people, I, some people, I, colleagues even, who say that. I don't, I don't agree with that, but they don't matter nearly as much as, as, as widely uh, believed. But there's a lot of other policies that are on the table that are very much up for a vote in this election. And the, um, the most obvious in terms of how it affects people's lives is, um, is health care. Uh, so we have, um, we passed a, ma a really major health reform in 2010, uh, most of which didn't go into effect until 2014. Uh, it's Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act. Um, it is by no means the health reform that anyone would have devised if you could start with a clean slate. It's a kind of a Rube Goldberg device of, of uh, designed to disturb existing arrangements as little as possible. So Obama got in some trouble by saying if you like your health insurance you can keep it, which wasn't strictly true, um, but in fact was true for the overwhelming majority. There were maybe a million people uh, who, I, I, now I, well, most people I think normal people you say a million people, they think, oh, that's a lot of people. But in America, it's not. You know, a, a million, a million people here, a million people there, and soon you're talking about a real impact on, the, on America. Uh, so it, uh, about a million people probably had cheap um, uh, policies with limited coverage, and they were healthy, and um, and those went away because the Affordable Care Act required insurance companies to offer the same policies to everybody, regardless of medical history and required that policies cover a minimum. So, so there was a, a relatively small number of, peop of healthy people who were hurt, but overwhelmingly people were left alone. Um, and in, it, in order to do that, you had to have this as a kind of a Rube Goldberg device. Um, it's uh, with, with uh, regulation of insurance companies uh, to prevent them from discriminating, but you couldn't do that alone, because if you do that, you actually have what the situation that prevailed in New York State. Uh, before Obamacare went into effect, which was, yeah, the insurance companies couldn't discriminate, and as a result, only healthy people bought, only, only sick people bought insurance, and so premiums were very high. So you had to include, along with that, measures to induce healthy people to buy insurance, which was a combination of subsidies um, and the individual mandate, a penalty for not having insurance. Republicans have eliminated the individual mandate, but that hasn't done as much damage as, as many people feared it would. The, the subsidies are still there. Eighty percent of the people buying individual policies are subsidized, which means that actually premium increases don't hit them. And so the, uh, um, the result has been, uh, well, here, the, uh, I just, um, this is, there are a couple of different, this is probably the, 
the most reliable and up-to-date. Uh, and we're looking at 18 to 64-year-old. Uh, we've Children are much more generously covered by Medicaid than, than adults. And of course, uh, uh, I got my Medicare card uh, uh, earlier this year. Uh, uh, and uh, so, yeah, 65 and older are all covered by Medicare, but it's in that intermediate range, and particularly younger adults who tended to be uninsured. Uh, and that, that was on a steady upward trend. Uh, and then in 2010, the uh, uh, Affordable Care Act was passed. Origin initially, it had some measures. The m most important was probably the one that, al that allowed children to stay on their parents' coverage until they were 26. So that's probably what's behind that decline in the number of uninsured in the first couple of years. And then the thing kicked in full tilt after 2014. Medicaid expansion, although not in half the states originally. Um, the exchanges with regulated insurance and subsidies. And that's a big deal. Actually, this is supposedly, are we on, are we streaming? Uh, whatever, anyway, the, uh, if you actually watch and listen very carefully to the signing ceremony, uh, for the Affordable Care Act. Um, uh, Joe Biden is, can be overheard saying in a very loud whisper, this is a big fucking deal. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, which it was. And it's, uh, um, now that is very much on the table. Um, the Republicans you know, failed by one vote, John McCain, to uh, essentially repeal the Affordable Care Act. And if they hold Congress, they will, one way or another, re repeal it. You could ask, will they replace it with a more conservative, market-based system? Um, well, they might, but it won't actually cover uh, anywhere near as many people. Because Obamacare is the conservative market-based system. There, between, there, there are alternatives, you know, on the, in, in terms of the intellectual uh, underpinnings of some form of, of trying to extend coverage. Um, you can go some kind of direct government provision of insurance, single payer, um, or you can do a, something where you try and uh, regulate insurers and subsidize people so as to kind of chippy a private insurance based system into covering uh, the bulk of the population. Um, that's, that's what Obamacare is. It's actually built on a template that was originally proposed by the Heritage Foundation and originally tried out in Massachusetts when a guy named Mitt Romney was governor. So, so Obamacare actually is the conservative alternative if you want to have widespread health care coverage. Um, it will be repealed if Republicans hold Congress. So we will see a substantial, although GDP growth will be the same whatever happens next month, uh, health care coverage will, be, will, will move very, very differently depending on what the outcome is in the elections. So that's a... Uh, um, that's something that is a really big uh, thing that's at stake. Um, okay, what about other economic policies? Um, now, some are really hard to I mean, Clearly, the, the climate on things like regulation, particularly financial and actually environmental regulation, uh, will be very different depending on what happens in the election. Uh, I'm not sure exactly uh, what to say there. Um, one of the really big uh, areas, certainly what, what I'm interested in as, as part of my, uh, my uh, you know, long-standing professional interests, um, is, will, will be international trade policy. And so let me talk about that. Now, it's not at all clear to me that that is going to depend very much on the midterm election. Um, and uh, uh, it's, it's, there, there's a, partly that's because the, the party's positions are not that clear on trade, but it's also because, the, rather oddly, uh, the way trade policy is made in the United States gives the president a remarkable amount of discretion. Um, so actually, let me, let me talk about that for a second, and then, then I'll talk about where we are. Um, so the U.S., we have a tra an international trading system which was basically built by the United States in its own image. Uh, we, we, it's, it's a very legalistic system. It's a, it's a rule-bound system. Um, we created it. It was actually started by Franklin Roosevelt, uh, the trade agreements program, which then uh, became the 
template for the general agreement on tariffs and trade, which eventually became the World Trade Organization. And the, the point is of it is that international trade is not set unilaterally by each country. It's set through agreements which set tariff rates, um, and we, you trade off. You say, we'll, we'll, we'll lower our tariff on your thing if you lower your tariff on our thing, um, which is uh, done because you, it, it actually helps you control your own special interests uh, because you get to set the interests of exporters against the interests of people who want protection from, from imports. Um, and it also, um, to, to, to some extent, countries may, may have a genuine unilateral interest in trying to exploit their power in world trade, impose tariffs to drive down the prices of what they import, uh, to uh, drive up the prices of what they export. But if everybody does that, it's a losing game. That's why we call it a trade war. So the, um, the, it's more like a trade arms race, actually. Uh, so the, um, we have international agreements to limit all that. Uh, but in order to make that work, you had to uh, take away from Congress the power to turn every trade agreement into a Christmas tree of special interest giveaways. T Congress had to do up and down votes on it. You know, the executive branch negotiates a trade agreement and then Congress says yay or nay. But in order to do that, you had to build some escape valves into the system. Because the people, who, the people who put this together were actually very smart and very worldly. They, they knew that if you made a system of you know, no, no deviations, an agreement is an agreement, no changes, it would blow apart because there would always be special cases that required action. So what they did was create essentially, it's a quasi-judicial process by which things, trade uh, um, issues are either presented to or not presented to the president for action, but essentially, the President of the United States has discretion to impose tariffs under certain conditions. Um, if uh, there's a finding of unfair, unfair practices by a foreign government, you can take action. Uh, if there's a finding of injury from a surge of imports, you can take action. If there's a finding that imports are a threat to national security, you can take action. All these things left for at the discretion of, of the executive branch because Otherwise, you, if you threw it to Congress, then, you know, then, then Senator Baumfog will, will, or, uh, will demand uh, that, that his, the clothespin factory in his district get a special break. And so this was all a way to smooth, and, and it's all based upon the assumption that, um, that the President of the United States will be very judicious in, in using these powers because, okay. So we're, we, we are where we are now. Um, and it's a huge range. So it turns out that, that you can adhere to the letter of those rules while you know, enormously violating their spirit. And um, so you can have a, uh, you know, the, we can use the national security uh, clause to limit imports of aluminum from Canada. Because you know, who knows what those na na nefarious uh, uh, the, 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 those Canadians might cut off our supply of aluminum foil. So anyway, the, um, so uh, it's not clear that that power won't go away with the election, regardless of how it comes out. So it, um, so trade policy is something where a lot of stuff could happen after the election. Uh, not clear that it depends on the election. So what is going to happen? Um, the, uh, some of us, I. I uh, there, there were, there were, I think there were really two issues, one of which is kind of resolved, the other of which is still way up in the air. Uh, one is, the, um, is NAFTA. So we have a trade agreement, now 25 years old, uh, between the United States, Mexico, and Canada. And it is, uh, uh, the, what it has done uh, is it has created an extremely integrated manufacturing system. Uh, if you look at cars, there's no such thing as a Canadian car or a Mexican car or a U.S. car. Every vehicle involves components from all three. Stuff moves back and forth the across the borders. They're, they're just, it's just an incre incredibly enmeshed system. And the betting that I, what I was saying from the beginning, but I was worried, I wavered a bit, was that in the end, there's just too much invested literally, uh, and also in terms of just the general structure of business in NAFTA for Trump to rip it apart. Whatever he says, he can't. He can't. The, the business would howl if there was any serious disruption to those trading arrangements. 
Uh, and for a while there, I wasn't sure because there was, the rhetoric was so heated. Um, and particularly, we got into a shouting match with Canada, which really, again, takes talent. Um, but the, uh, uh, but the, um, in the end, you know, they're saying that it's no longer NAFTA. So they, uh, although the, the documents don't say that, but, but the administration is saying it's now no longer NAFTA. It's now the, the USMCA, uh, the United States-Mexico-Canada Agreement, um, which I have to say, my first thought, which just shows how boring I am, I thought, thought this, does this have something to do with the Marines? Uh, but in fact, several of my colleagues independently have something to do with the village people. Um, but the... Uh, um, but the USMCA, is, or whatever it is, is there are some there are some possibly sticky provisions in there involving uh, North American content of automobiles, and that may be a story that will. But basically, NAFTA has been preserved. So that's. Uh, um, however, uh, if we get to the rest, particularly trade with China, and all of that, then it's far from clear that we're. Uh, that we will not, we, we may, yet, may yet have the, uh, the trade war. And um, uh, that could be a pretty big thing. Um, if you try, uh, try to estimate how, how, how much effect uh, a full-on trade war might have, uh, you can, there, there's a, a lot of questions and assumptions that need to be made, but if you, if you try to think about everybody operating unilaterally in their own interest and try to plug in best available numbers for, you know, elasticities of substitution, and uh, uh, it won't get too far into the weeds here, um, you end up with the, po the models end up saying that you might be looking at something like 40% tariffs and, uh, and it's something like a 50% reduction in world trade. Now, that wouldn't be the, uh, NAFTA would be out of it, so we'd be talking, but it, they're startlingly big. And by the way, as it happens, the, that's putting you in roughly the same range as what happened with the Smoot-Hawley tariff at the beginning of the 1930s. So uh, you could imagine, now, how bad is that? Um, for the world economy, even that is not as big a deal as you might think. Uh, there are, it, it's fine. Everybody thinks that world trade, that free trade, is terrifically important, except the people who actually specialize in international trade economics. Um, where um, th that kind of trade war would probably reduce world GDP by around two percent in the long run, uh, or not much more than that. Uh, if I more, um, if you think about it, forty percent tariff, means that the marginal import your that, that is blocked by the tariff, you would have been willing to pay 40% more than the true cost, which means that the average is 20%, which means if you're reducing world trade, uh, it, it ends up um, that, that it would be in that range. Now, the, it would be hugely disruptive, not as disruptive as a breakdown in NAFTA would be, but you still have very integrated production. People, people have made a lot of investments. People have, uh, have chosen where to, where to work um, based upon the existing structure of world trade and you'd be disrupting all of that. So then it, there could be a lot of people facing harsh consequences. Actually, one of the most important economics papers of the past 15 years was a paper written in part by one of my old students uh, called The China Shock, um, which argued that the rapid increase in exports from China uh, over the years, roughly from the late 90s to about 2007, uh, although it arguably made America richer, uh, had a impact, a large impact on communities that happened to be in, in the path of that import surge. And so that a lot of people were displaced. And um, I think that was a very important insight. Um, the thing is that if we, had, if we go into a full-on trade war, uh, it'll be another China shock. Uh, it'll be in the reverse, but we've already adapted to the, the, the patterns of trade we have. So it's a lot like the old joke about the, the motorist who runs over a pedestrian and says, oh, I'm so sorry, let me fix that, so he backs up and runs over him again. Uh, it, so that, that could be a really disruptive thing. And it would also be devastating. The U.S. economy, could, the European economy, they can shrug this kind of thing off. Probably even the Chinese can when all is said and done. Uh, um, smaller, poorer countries, you know, Bangladesh, uh, literal, almost literally keeps its head above water because of its ability to export low-cost clothing. Uh, 
was said about someplace else, but you know, it, it, this is not a banana republic, it's a pajama republic. Um, it's, uh, but no, seriously, small, small poor countries desperately need open world markets to be able to survive. And so that's, uh, there could be a lot of nasty consequences out there. And of course, the, the world trading system, the, peop the, the architects of that system weren't just thinking about economic gains. They also believed that having a lot of strong trading relations was good for peace, that it helped to build a, an international community, that the, the, the European Union owed its origins originally to an attempt to make sure that European industry was too integrated for France and Germany to ever go to war again. And it, it, in, a, in a looser sense, that's what the whole, and of course now, if you have the country that was the, the leader of the system, the, uh, the um, behaving, um, basically saying that, that uh, international trade agreements are our suggestions uh, and that we can rip them up anytime we feel like it, that gets to be a, a real problem for uh, the broader atmosphere in the world, but then it's not the only source of, of that kind of problem. Um, so, bottom line, uh, I think if you ask, how, you know, how, what do I think is going to happen to GDP over the next year, I think it's going to grow 2.5%, and, and I don't think plus or minus, but uh, I don't think the election is going to matter for that. Um, I think that the size of the U.S. budget deficit in, uh, uh, over the next decade is going to depend a lot on what happens next month. Uh, I think that health insurance for probably tens of millions of people is hanging in the balance. Um, and the world trading system, that is possibly quite possibly heading for a big blow up, but I think that might happen even if Democrats uh, win big, uh, because that's really not it under Congress's control. Um, and it's going to be really interesting, and I'm going to be on an airplane election night. Uh, I'm going to land in, in, uh, in Germany and turn on my phone and with great trepidation. Uh, for many reasons, economics actually not being the, the most of them, but that's, that's certainly one of them. End of talk. Let's have questions. So I'd like to start because I have a slight personal interest in this. Can you talk about what you think will happen with Social Security and what will happen with Medicare and whether the election will make a difference? Okay. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm actually... I'm actually quite unsure about, about that. Clearly, there's a piece of the Republican Party, and certainly a lot of the parties, if you like, the, the intelligentsia, um, um, would like to radically transform Medicare and Social Security. They'd like to convert Medicare to a voucher system uh, that lets you buy private insurance. Uh, they'd like to um, convert Social Security into a system of individual accounts. Uh, on the other hand, uh, they've been burned pretty badly trying to do, the, you know, uh, I was actually, I taught my, I teach a class on a lot of this stuff, uh, I was talking about Social Security today and the, remembering the 2005 attempt to uh, transform Social Security, which ended up, um, it, it crashed and burned even though Republicans were in control of the White House and Congress because it was just so desperately unpopular. Um, and uh, it was desperately unpopular even in very red states, actually especially in very red states, which tend to be even more reliant on Social Security than, than, than people are here. Um, so, and it's the same, I think, is true of Medicare. Uh, so now it's possible that, that we would have a sufficiently ideological push that they would transform, but I think it's going to be really hard. And the, actually I was, I was so uh, those of us of a certain age even remember when Reagan tried to uh, change Social Security, which lasted about six weeks. And, uh, and that, that I remember a cartoon showing a political debate from 1981 in which one candidate said, well, I, if elected, will never cut Social Security. And his opponent says, well, I will never, never cut Social Security. And it's, because uh, that's it's such a, it's, so those are, I think that the, the uh, any, proposing any significant benefit cuts for older Americans is very politically radioactive. Maybe, God knows, but we, we, we are in, you know, in, in a very different political universe from anything I imagined, but it, even I, I find that hard to see. Medicaid, different story. 
might become a lot harder that for, for people, uh, for, for low income people to get health insurance. Hi, Dr. Kuhlman. My question actually is about spending, quality government. Um, as I've found for midterm elections, specifically Congress, that spending quality government gets under control under Democratic presidents with Republican Congresses, and it's under Republican presidents where spending gets out of control. So I was wondering your take on that, spending quality government. Okay. Um I don't think under control is the right word here. Um, the, uh, now, first of all, the, you know, the big items. You know, the federal budget is uh, uh, defense, um, uh, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and interest on the debt. And most of the other stuff is relatively small change. And no, nobody has been really willing to touch any of those. Uh, under any administration. If anything, Republicans have tended to spend more on defense and not less on the other stuff. What they have tended to do is squeeze, uh, uh, I think this is actually true, it's actually even true to some extent under Republican presidents, but certainly with Democratic presidents, they squeeze on the, the other stuff, which the domestic uh, discretionary spending, which is, uh, you know, a grab bag of, of things, many of them things that make life a little bit less miserable. And so, uh, uh, so you know, the, that, that's the stuff that, that Republicans in Congress don't want to spend on. Um, so, uh, but it, it, it tends to be pretty much at the margins. And the fact that as we haven't, you know, spending, the big swings in our budget have not come from spending. Uh, they, they've come from, from changing taxes. And so the reason why, it's certainly true that Republicans have run much bigger deficits than Democrats have. But that's largely because Republicans have cut taxes and Democrats have raised them. Yeah, hi. I have an existential question. Trump and the Republicans refuse to deal with climate change. So what's, going to t what's it going to take for that to happen? Secondly, the guy who has typically con has controlled this for a long time has been Charles Koch. What do you think Charles Koch really thinks about climate change, or is it all money? Okay. Yeah. Um, it's going to be really... Uh, I mean, obviously, um, if, even if Democrats take uh, both houses of Congress, um, which is, I think, 21% according to Nate Silver now. Um, unlikely, but, but not, not, uh, not wildly unlikely. Uh, there'll still be a Republican president, so nothing will happen on the climate change front. Um, and the, the, you know, what ha we had imagined was going to happen until the 2016 election was that we'd, we'd be taking action on climate through executive action. We basically be using the powers of the EPA, because well, the funny thing about climate change is to to, to do it right. Every economic, every car carrying economist says, oh, you know, you want to have broad based incentives. You need a carbon tax or a cap and trade system. But the fact of the matter is that most of the stuff that you would want to do right away is basically um, shut down coal burning fire, uh, power plants. And so uh, regulatory action is a potential, and, and mileage standards on cars can do a lot more. Uh, so there was a possibility that just executive action could do a lot. Now, obviously, that won't happen with this executive. Um, if you, on the other hand, this is, uh, I'm actually trying to think about this. Um, in, you know, in, in uh, 2009, the House did pass Waxman-Markey, which was a significant uh, uh, cap-and-trade uh, system for climate change, which died in the Senate. Um, but imagine it's uh, 2021, and Democrats, if suppose the Democrats have taken both houses, and, uh, and the Democrat is in the White House. Uh, so President, I don't know, Michael Avenatti, whatever. Anyway, the, uh, <laughs> uh, it's such a wild universe, who knows? But anyway, imagine that the Democratic president and the, uh, and the I'm not, I think if, if Democrat, it's going to be, the Democratic Party is, is more progressive than it was. And a Democratic Congress 
if, if it happened again, I wouldn't be too surprised to see that actual serious climate change legislation would pass. But of course, that's, um, if you, you know, the new IPCC report says that's already getting very late in the game. So we may, that might not be in time enough to avoid catastrophe. Um, I have, you know, what, uh, what does, what do the climate deniers with the fossil fuel, what do they really believe? I'm not sure that they even really do have uh, I think we, we imagine that, pe that people have a clear-cut distinction between what's in their financial interest and what they believe truly ought to be done. And I think most people are better at double-think than that. They, they manage to, so they're not exactly, they, they know perfectly well that they're supporting um, bogus research that serves their financial interests, and yet at the same time, I don't think they have clear in their minds that this is bogus research. So they, they're, um, there are relatively few villains out there, you know, twirling their mustachios and cackling to themselves about being, people have an amazing ability. I mean, there are many real villains out there, but they're not, they're not, they don't cackle usually. <laughs> Some of them might, but they, uh, um, they have the ability to rationalize. But I have to say, if, if I were, this, the climate stuff is getting scary enough that I would, would have a hard time. If, if, I, I would think that even if I, even if my, fortune were bound up in, in keeping coal plants open, uh, I would be starting to say, but, you know, do, I, I would like to have a world for my, my children and grandchildren to live in, but that's, that's just me. I also wanted to continue on with that. You know, Charles Koch is a very well-educated man. He, he, he's, he's no dummy. So it's just... There's a lot of, yeah, uh, what, we, what we're learning is, we've learned a lot about human nature. Uh, in recent years, and one of them is that being well-educated and, and privileged it doesn't necessarily mean that you're not going to adopt some really uh, scary positions. Uh, I know you mostly focused on the change in the GDP, and uh, it wouldn't make much of a difference one way or another, but it does make a difference in terms of the composition of the GDP, yeah. and particularly with respect to climate change. It depends on how we provide our energy. And I guess I wanted to ask you that, as well as uh, you did not mention much about the distribution of income yeah. that may be affected by whoever runs Congress over the next two years. Thank you. OK. Um, yeah. So I sit, by the way, at the Stone Center for the Study of Socioeconomic Inequality at, at City University of New York. And uh, although I'm more of a consumer of research and a rainmaker for the people who do the real research than, than an active, but I, uh, so, but my colleagues worry about this stuff all the time. Um, and there's two things that you can do to affect income inequality. One is um, taxes and, and, and transfers, government uh, collecting money, you know, taxing the rich and, and helping the, those less well off. Um, and that's clearly gonna be a big difference depending on who ends up controlling Congress. Um, and even more so, if two years from now, who ends up controlling uh, Congress and the White House. Um, then there's pre-distribution, the ability, basically things that affect the bargaining power of workers, which include m minimum wage, but also how favorable are the laws uh, and their enforcement to union organizing. Um, and those things might, over time, make a, be very susceptible. I think those would be much slower acting. Um, if you want to ask, you know, if, if there's going to be a revival of the U.S. labor uh, movement, it's not going to happen overnight, and it's not gonna, certainly not going to hinge on the election results next month. Um, it, it would, uh, but these things do seem to matter. I mean, you, um, it's um, uh, the, the t among among advanced countries, the two extremes of income distribution are the United States. And and you ask why does Denmark, Denmark have much lower inequality than we do? Uh, why do they have much lower inequality? Partly it's because the government is, is bigger and it doesn't actually, the tax system isn't especially more progressive, but it's bigger and it finances very generous uh, programs of aid. Um, and, but also pre-government action, their income distribution is much more equal and that's probably because two thirds of their workforce is unionized. And that in turn uh, goes, and they're, you know, they're facing the same global market forces, the same technology we are, but they've made different political choices. And you can imagine that over time, 
the United States could change its choices, but that's a, that's a, a decades process. It's not something that's going to happen after one election. Hello. Uh, there was a Times article published a few days ago that discussed um, donors on Wall Street donating to uh, Democratic campaigns as opposed to conservative in the past. I was wondering if you could speak to that. Um, okay, I actually have been meaning to read that article and haven't. But, um, <laughs> but look, I would say um, uh, financiers are people too. And there's a lot of stuff that goes on in, uh, in uh, there's a lot of stuff that's at stake in current political debates. It's not just about people's individual, you know, about, about their taxes. Uh, um, uh, people do not consistently, uh, people on average tend to vote in their self-interest, but not that consistently. And it's, uh, so there was a famous book by Thomas Frank called What's the Matter with Kansas? Uh, which was political scientists, uh, you know, have um, gripe about the book, saying he, he missed a bunch of stuff and he oversimplified. But the, but it was about why do working class people vote for for conservative governments uh, that that are that that hurt them. Uh, but one of the responses that was particularly interesting was there was a um, I think it's Andrew Gelman at Columbia saying that we should also be asking what's the matter with Connecticut. Because there's a, there are these wealthy people in blue states who vote for very liberal governments that actually tax them quite heavily, um, and the point being that that uh, social values uh, uh, trumping, sorry, can't, another verb I can't use anymore, but it's social values uh, over over mattering more for your voting choice than than your your personal. Uh, financial interest is something that happens at the top as well as uh, uh, among the working class. A lot, of, you know, I, if uh, if that weren't, um, if that didn't happen, we the, uh, the Stone Center couldn't exist. Uh, you know, where do you think we get the money to pay our postdocs? Uh, and um, uh, so, so it, it's no. I think that it it is interesting. I think I think part of the the particular. Um, unabashed exploitation of culture war issues by the current administration and its allies uh, probably does a lot to, to turn things, uh, to, to induce wealthy, wealthy Wall Street people to, uh, to give money to the other party. Yeah, two quick questions. One is, what has been the impact of the Fed rate hike on US businesses and companies? And secondly, considering China's rapid military modernization, increase in defense budget, their Belt and Road Initiative, which has a geostrategic component, not just an economic one, and militarization of the South China Sea. Don't you see China as a future military threat to the US? OK. Um, so on the first one, uh, now the rate hikes, the dollar is up. You know, the trade deficit is slowly widening, not exactly what Trump wants to see, but they, but that's because, you know, and so the, uh, um, and, um, and the, and housing is starting to show some signs of weakness, and uh, it's all the standard stuff, it's what you'd expect from rate hikes. Um, I would not be, I, if I were the Fed, I would actually be waiting. I, I think the, um, I think they're right that inflation is, is pretty much back uh, to a 2% target, but I think the 2% target is too low. I, I would like to see them let it rip for a while and let inflation get up above that. Um, but uh, anyway, given what they're doing, it's 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 having the standard effects. Nothing nothing catastrophic, but not, but uh, but not pleasant for certain sectors of the economy. Uh, I have no. What do I know about military stuff? Um, and now China is a giant economy, uh, which means it has the resources. To have a, a powerful military, um, and it's a um, it certainly does think geostrategically, and um, and it these days seems to have a more coherent vision of what it's trying to do than we do. Um, but uh, I have to say, I think. Well, no, I was going to say I, I would imagine that a lot of people in China would have this a lot of people in the leadership circles in China would uh, understand the same thing that hopefully most 
uh, we've learned, which is that um, military adventurism is a really bad way to even to, to expand your power in, in the modern world. I mean, there was the, you know, the famous book, Norman Angel, the, the great, uh, the grand illusion before World War I, which basically said, you know, Congress will make, impoverish everybody, which people thought, took to mean that there will be no more wars. He didn't quite say that, but it, and of course we did have the war, but it turns out that, that, that even a victorious campaign, even, you know, conquest, do you, do you think Russia has become more powerful by annexing Crimea? It's actually, it's, it's, a, it's a giant money pit uh, for the Putin regime. And, and so I would have think that the Chinese, you would hope, but of course you never know, uh, some, you know, Chinese regime in domestic trouble might decide to, uh, uh, to, to uh, wag the dog and it can get out of control. Of course, the American, you know, there have been these persistent rumors, which I hope are not true, that, that the Trump administration is considering an invasion of Venezuela, which you can see why they, you know, which would, would be a, uh, even though it's a horrible regime, would end, you know, I, I, would, I would have hoped that we had learned our lesson from Iraq, but God knows, these days it doesn't seem like anybody ever learns anything from anything. First, I'd like to thank you for your column. I read it a lot, and I really appreciate it. And thank you well, for it. Thank for you. It, it's really a sane voice in a very, very noisy environment, and, and thank you for that. Okay. My question, uh, I'm a healthcare executive, and I find it getting increasingly frustrating and inordinately complicated in our uh, current uh, payment payer uh, scheme. And I wondered if you had any thoughts or reflections on a single payer system and what it would take. Oh, um, if I could do it, I'd go single payer right now. That's been always been, that's, but wait, that has always been my position. Um, and if you can do it from scratch, that's all, that's what you would want to do. So, uh, um, so Taiwan, uh, created a single payer system, it apparently works quite well, and it's, uh, uh, the, 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 the problem for the U.S. has been, um, it's, it's actually, it, it, people say, well, you know, you have to deal with the special interests, the insurance companies and the drug companies, which is true, and is a, is a big part of the reason why you couldn't do that. Um, but it's also true that people are, by and large, conservative, not in the political sense, but in the sense of if, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And the fact of the matter is that uh, the reason Obamacare looks the way it does, it was partly that they didn't want to repeat the mistakes of 93. They wanted to bring the insurance industry on board. They wanted to you know, appease the, the powerful interest groups. But also that they realized that the majority of working age Americans have insurance through their uh, employers. They like it. Um, it's probably the case that a, we could devise a single payer system that would end up being better for them, costing the, you know, their paychecks would be higher because it would be cheaper and it would be just as good care. But trying to convince people of that, say, you have a system, it's working for you, but trust me, I have this way better single payer system uh, and we'll, we'll just rip up what you have and, and replace it with something much better. Don't worry, it'll be fine. Even if that's true, people are not going to believe you. It's just too hard. So it, it, there's, a, there's a very strong element of path dependence here. The fact that we evolved this kind of crazy quilt of, of Medicare and Medicaid and, and employer-based insurance um, makes it very hard to move to single payer. The, the, uh, so what I would be, I mean, something like um, you know, bring back the public option, make it possible for people to buy into Medicare so that over time, probably increasing numbers of people would migrate in. That's, that's a, a feasible strategy, saying we're going to transform the whole system in one stroke. It's possible, but the, the odds that it would crash and burn on you politically are just too high. Hello. Thanks for coming and talk. I'm Karosh, finance major at Go Minor. Uh, I wanted to talk just about, I guess, your outlook on the markets. About so, uh, which side? Oh, pardon? Which markets? Oh, the U.S. markets, U.S. markets. So oh. in terms of regulation or perhaps deregulation that's been going on, I think uh, it's fair to say that Trump wants to deregulate and get rid of Dodd-Frank. And obviously we have a nice stock market 
rally. How far do you see that going? What is your take, I guess, if the midterm elections have anything to do with a more increased regulation in the short term or perhaps in the long term? Okay, I don't think the, well, okay, if, if Republicans hold Congress, they might scrap Dodd-Frank in large part. Now, um, given the way that Dodd-Frank, the trouble with Dodd-Frank from the beginning, and it was, it was a smart piece of legislation, uh, but the trouble was that it was, it dealt with a lot of difficult issues with, with, a, by, with executive discretion. Um, so the question was, how do you create, uh, f for example, how do you create a, um, a system for resolution, uh, resolution authority, a way for to take over, um, but, but you want, you need to regulate, the, the problem, I'm sorry, back up. The problem that Dodd-Frank was largely supposed to solve was that much of modern banking isn't done by banks. So we have the shadow banking and uh, you know, bank, regular old banks, we have a system. We have deposit insurance, we have well-established procedures for seizing a bank that's, uh, that's, that's bankrupt and, and uh, keeping it in operation, protecting the depositors, but cleaning out the stockholders. Um, but how do you do that for, for uh, AIG or for uh, uh, various kinds of, of financial institutions that don't fit the standard picture of a bank? And there's a lot of those out there. So Dodd-Frank dealt with all of that by creating pretty much a, a very discretionary system where a, a committee of the Fed and the Treasury and um, uh, decides what, what are strategically, sorry, si what are systemically important financial institutions, CIFIs. And the question is, what is a CIFI? And it's kind of like pornography, you know it when you see it. And, it's, uh, um, and then they get to impose capital requirements on CIFIs and they get to um, seize them in, in case of trouble, all of which, because there was a real problem. There was a, there was a very strong case in 2009 for, for seizing a couple of the big financial institutions, but they were these sprawling things. There was partly bank, partly non-bank, and it wasn't clear that they had the legal authority to do it. Um, and, but all of this depends upon um, the regulators having the desire to be effective regulators and having good judgment about what works, and again, here we are. So, uh, um, so we have a system that's very much dependent upon having uh, the the executive branch want to do financial regulation. And since um, since it doesn't, un under current circumstances, it's not clear how much Dodd Frank is is doing anymore. Um, and that won't change again with the election. Uh, that's that's going to be up in the air. So we hope that the next financial crisis waits until. Uh, until we have somebody who, who actually uh, believes uh, that, that in, in financial regulation uh, in, at the top. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Mr. Kerman. So uh, uh, as you probably know that the elderly uh, group are very, very engaged in uh, political, uh, their part political participation is incredibly high. They are really engaged. Sorry, which groups? Uh, who? Pardon? Sorry, we, I didn't hear which groups. Oh, the elderly groups. The elderly people are, uh, their political participation is incredibly high, making it very difficult to reform things that uh, directly affect them, predominantly social security. So uh, I was wondering uh, that with that in mind, knowing that uh, making any kind of changes to the social security. Uh, as oh, elderly was what you said. Elderly, I, what did I say? No, we couldn't, it, it was, it was uh, sound quality was bad. I couldn't feel oh, it. elderly, okay. yes. Uh, uh. Yeah, no, uh, no, the trouble with, with, with uh, senior citizens is, uh, uh, <laughs> which I'm allowed to say, I'm 65 now, so I get to, uh, is, is that they, um, they do vote. Um, they are very protective of their self-interest and, uh, and they're expensive. So that's the, you know, the thing about, uh, um, uh, you know, it, it put it, so I, yeah, I mean, the, um, uh, it, it comes back in a way to the question about Medicare and Social Security. Those are really hard to, to touch because, because of the, the people who would be affected. And, um, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, right. Uh, so, sorry. Well, sorry. So, yeah. well, well, so going off with that, 
you think it's a better idea to leave the entire idea of social security to the forces of the market and privatize the thing? But to leave what, what to the forces of the market? For the forces of the market, just uh, let it be privatized the whole system, and then oh, with no. th some regulation, you uh, make it more feasible for the uh, for the uh, elderly group. So you mean uh, Medicare or? Uh, I mean social security because. Oh no. Okay, so both the, the point about uh, both um, is that uh, well, two things. So, so on healthcare, look, uh, markets work really badly in healthcare. They work famously badly in healthcare. We've known that forever. And 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 the idea that you're going to make Medicare any more efficient by by privatizing it is you know is is in the teeth of all experience. Um, and on Social Security, the Social Security system is very efficient. It's, uh, it has very low operating costs. Um, it is, uh, uh, and the experience, experiences with uh, private uh, and, you know, account based systems have been really pretty bad. Uh, you know, the, back during the Social Security debate of, uh, of the mid 2000s, there, there was all this romance about Chile on the right, and it turns out that Chileans hated their system and have moved to a system that looks a lot more like ours now. Um, the, um, and on top of all of that, if you ask about, think about what's happened on the private sector. Uh, to the extent that we have private retirement plans, they used to be all defined benefit. You got pension. Now they shifted over time to defined contribution, where you put money in and then you have some amount. And first of all, Turns out people don't get have enough remotely, and also that they're extremely risky. People lose, and so we have one pillar of stability in our retirement system, which is Social Security as it is, which is a defined benefit plan, is there regardless of what happens to the market. Uh, try to make that more like, uh, I'm sound like Trump, the, the failing private retirement system. Uh, it sounds like, you know, why buy f further into something which we've, you know, we've, we've seen that future and it doesn't work. So, no, I, I don't see any reason to do it. I mean, it, it, and I don't see any really reason, no reason f to cut Social Security. Um, that it, there just isn't, the, the idea that that's an intolerable burden on, on the future, the 1% of GDP as the, um, as, as the baby boomers will move fully into retirement. And it's, uh, it's just not a make or break. And that's, that's a piece of our system that is really uh, was built well, uh, works smoothly. The number of people who are paying for the Social Security uh, with respect to the number of people who are receiving the benefits. As we know, the ratio is, is no. shrinking, right? We have, to, but that's that's all. That that one percent of GDP takes that into account. Remember, a large part of the baby boom move into Social Security has already happened. You know, with that big transition as as the baby boomers hit, we're already halfway there. So it, it's it, that that's almost behind in our rearview mirror now. The, uh, it's a bigger issue for countries, you know, it, it, with with worse demography than we have. But it's it, we're, we're that that's just not at the top of the agenda. All right, thank you. Thanks. Hello, um, I wanted to ask how the attitudes towards immigration will affect the elections and your opinion on it. Well, um, I could say quite literally, not my department. Uh, no, it's a very, fun, I mean, it, I don't, I mean, I'm having a hard time figuring out where this is really going to go. Uh, I mean, until 2016, it was, uh, it seemed as if immigration was just much less of a political issue than we thought, but now uh, uh, it seems to be, but I, I have a, it, it's all a little bit mysterious, uh, or it, I, I, I have a feeling that most of the immigration agitation is not really about immigration. Um, uh, if you think, you know, first of all, you know, there's this uh, national panic about uh, crime by undocumented immigrants and MS-13, all of which is, is almost, it's, it's almost pure invention. There is no 
crime wave from undocumented immigrants. Their MS-13 has apparently killed only one person in the last two years. Uh, so that these are all sort of invented stuff um, that are play because they play into some other anxiety. And then, of course, the, the places that are most hostile to immigration within the United States tend to be the places that don't actually have any significant number of immigrants. So West Virginia really hates immigrants, except they've never seen any. And, um, and New Jersey, which is the most immigrant-heavy place, or uh, actually there was this, uh, uh, I had one, you know, I get, I, most of the really crazy email has gone away. It's mostly gone to Twitter, where I don't look at it. But, the, uh, but I got this one uh, a, a Sheriff Joe supporter who said, uh, uh, you know, you just don't know what it's like from New Mexico, saying you just don't know what it's like here on the border. How would you feel if New York was full of immigrants? But, uh, <laughs> Uh, so, okay, but I have, how it'll play in the election, I have no idea. These are the last three questions okay. for the evening. Hi, Mr. Krugman. Thanks for coming to Hofstra. Um, in the New York Times article about the Trump family and their taxes, uh, going back to, I believe, since Donald was about three years old. Yeah. What do you think New York State and the fed feds are gonna do pertaining to that, since it's what they say, it's more than $400 million? Yeah, so I have no idea <laughs> what the legal <laughs> you know, ramifications, uh, whether to what extent anybody can be held account for that now. I'm told that your simple view that it's all statute of limitations is not actually right, that they still go after the heirs for the, for the money they received. Uh, but the, um, and I'm sure they'll try. And the, the, it's highly likely that the, New York, uh, the next attorney general of New York will be somebody who's already said that she's gonna try and go after this stuff. Um, I think the, the bigger question is, how was, this was so crude, so raw, um, that it obviously, there was really very little attempt to enforce uh, the laws. And uh, the question is whether the, whatever the factors were that made tax enforcement so lax over basically the entire history of the Trump family um, will change and whether the state will, uh, state and it will, will try to enforce. Uh, it's it just, there just seems to have been so much stuff that, that, it, that it was an open secret that, that uh, not just the Trumps, but other families weren't paying what they owed. Why was nothing done? And that's, that's I think, going to be a, a really interesting question to see whether any of that changes now. But I have no idea. And the legalities, uh, yeah, I have no idea. It's not, it's not, it, that, that's, that's another discipline that, that <laughs> is beyond, I can't, I don't understand. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kurman, for being here tonight and the speech. Uh, uh, I would like to ask, like, uh, if you, uh, you know about the trade wars and the, the, Sorry? Ch uh, the Chinese market and the trade war. Uh, yeah. The trade, yeah, yeah. What do you think it would, would go like later? Because uh, if it go like foreign trade war and uh, like, you know, the, the Chinese, like, there is rumors that our country might be more depending on our own citizen. Like, they are trying, the regime are trying to close up the country a little bit. Like, doing lesser trade and what do you think? And, and after, like, on the 7th, this, this October, uh, our, like, the central uh, banking, uh, they, they, they lowered uh, the, the monetary reserve for 1%, and yeah. af even after that, our market keep, uh, keeps going down. And what do you think the Chinese market and the, the yeah. economy will go later? Well, China, I mean, China has a lot of uh, issues independent of whatever Trump's doing. There, there is a, in a way, it has, it's had a model uh, of, of economic performance that relied on extremely high, basically unsustainable rates of investment and low consumer demand. And it has not managed to make a transition there. So China has been looking shaky for quite a while, um, independent of, of, of this. And then the you know, US, Chinese exports to the US are up over the past year, not down. So the, the trade war is not having any impact visibly on the trade flows. It appears to be hitting the Chinese market, though it could be other things there. Um, as to how far we go, I don't, I have no idea. Um, 
the, uh, let's say this is actually, we're really trying to model the mind of Donald Trump in a lot of ways here. And uh, the, the only thing to say is that there are still substantial business stakes. Uh, businesses would be hurt, U.S. businesses would be hurt by a full-on trade war with China. Uh, and they may have some voice in this. And there's another thing which I think will start to weigh in, which is that we're seeing what looks increasingly like um, basically everybody against the U.S. That China and Europe start to, to strike trade deals. Um, Japan is already deeply enmeshed in the Chinese economy. So that it's not, you know, the, the collectively the, the wealthy economies still have a lot. But if, they, if, if it's just, just America against, against the world, then the U.S. is in a much weaker position than I think the administration realizes. But God knows what, you know, it's uh, uh, the, uh, how can I say, I mean, the, the, uh, the, the, the key people on trade policy in the administration, well, let me just say do not inspire confidence. <laughs> Um, thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, unfortunately, I come from the generation that doesn't vote. Um, I know so many people who say we're from New York, the state is blue, it doesn't matter. What do you think is one of the biggest things we need to take into consideration coming these midterms that just might push us to go to the polls? Oh, I, you know, this is not my, this, this is not um, at all my expertise. I mean, I, I have, uh, um, There's, there's, um, I'm tempted to make some, to say something snarky, but let me not. Um, the, uh, I hope that, uh, that the steady drumbeat of, of things that are happening, terrible things that are happening, will cause some political awakening. I mean, I, I, I it, even in, even two years ago, there were an awful lot of young people who just seemed to who seemed to believe that nothing much was at stake, and which I, you know, I not only could I have told them that wasn't true, I did to the best of my ability. But, but I hope that by now people realize that uh, if you if you think that you can just distance yourself from politics and not, and and it's 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 not your concern. Uh, boy, are you wrong! It's, uh, it's so much. So much matters. It's not GDP growth, but so much else matters. Um, uh, the kind of the kind of uh, civilization we're going to be is very much up in the air. And and uh, and as we've seen, a few thousand votes, one way or the other, can make all the difference. So, yeah. But will will that message break through? I have no idea. Okay. Please join me in thanking Paul Krugman.